One for the money, two for the show. Are you all ready? Well, then let's go. Rah, rah, rah. That's not Mother Goose, of course, but it's me, Rand. Let's go. Do you have your... We have our pots and pans. Do you have the shakers, too? Yes, we have the shakers, too. Do you have a homemade kazoo? Yes, we have a homemade kazoo. Do we have the drummers, too? Yes, we have the drummers, too. Do we have some jingle bells? Yes, we have some jingle bells. Do you, too? Pots and pans. Pots and pans. Shakers, homemade kazoo. Homemade kazoo. Blow me and play along. Pots and pans. Shakers, too. To see a fine lady upon a fine horse Rings on her fingers and bells on her toes So she shall have music wherever she goes Ride a cock horse Sure, you all know it But just what is the story behind it? It seems that in the town of Banbury, England there stood a very elaborate cross made of stone in the marketplace. Leading into the town was a very steep hill, and in order for any coach to get to the town of Banbury, they first had to stop at the bottom of the hill to add another very strong horse to help pull the coach up the hill. This high-spirited horse was always gaily decorated and was called the cock horse, and the townspeople were very proud of it. One day, so the saying goes, the queen was paying a visit to the Banbury Cross. She wore a beautiful gown, had on lots of jewelry, and as was customary for ladies of great wealth in those days, had bells on the toes of her shoes. At the bottom of the hill, they put on the extra cock horse. But before very long, the coach lost a wheel. The queen, not to disappoint the townspeople of Banbury, climbed down from the broken coach and mounted the beribboned cock horse, then rode into Banbury to see the cross on a fine horse with rings on her fingers and bells on her toes. And the town musicians played lively music to welcome their queen. Ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross to see a fine lady upon a fine horse Rings on her fingers and bells on her toes So she shall have music wherever she goes Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall Humpty Dumpty had a great fall all the king's horses and all the king's men Couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again 
Poor old Humpty Dumpty. Broken egg yolk all over the place. But stop a moment. Does it make much sense to you that an egg would be sitting on a wall? And why would the king's men even try to put him back together? Most rhymes of long ago, we find made reference to something else. In this case, Humpty Dumpty, also a term for describing rather fat people, referred to King Richard III of England, who was a rather pudgy gentleman. During the Battle of Bosworth, in the year 1485, he was perched upon a high hill, directing his soldiers, when, unfortunately, the poor fellow was killed. Of course, we all know that nothing his men could do would bring him back to life. But now, if you read the rhyme over again, you'll find it makes quite a bit of sense. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. Along with making sense, there was really a lot of nonsense back in Mother Goose's day. We all know the tongue twister, Peter Piper picked a peck of peppers, but not all of us can say it. Can you? Now here's another one, still used today as an aid in speech classes. Betty Botter bought some butter, but she said the butter's bitter. If I put it in my batter, it will make my batter bitter. But a bit of better butter will make my batter better. So she bought a bit of butter, better than her bitter butter. And she put it in her batter, and the batter was not bitter. So it was better Betty Botter bought a bit of better butter. Little Tom Tucker sings for his supper. What shall we give him white bread and butter? How can he cut it without air a knife? How can he marry without air a wife? This is a rather sad story, as it takes place in the Europe of many, many years ago, when children who had lost their parents were not provided for as they are today. People then seem to be too busy with their own problems to bother to think of others less fortunate than they. Little children with no mother or father actually had to beg on the streets for food to eat. Those who were lucky enough to possess a voice were able to sing songs underneath the windows of the wealthy houses, holding up a basket or a hat in hopes that some morsel of food would be tossed to them from above. These children became known as Tom Tuckers. Some possessed such fine voices that they became famous. And it became the custom, which we still carry out today, especially at holiday time, to share our food with those less fortunate than we. Little Tom Tucker sings for his supper. What shall we give him white bread and butter? How can he cut it? Without air a knife, how can he marry without air a wife? Rock a bye, baby, on the treetop when. Cradle will fall and down will come, baby, cradle and fall. This is the best known lullaby both in England and America, but it is generally felt that this one originated in America. The story has been handed down that a young pilgrim boy who came over on the Mayflower became very friendly with a certain Indian family. He noticed that they made a cradle for their little baby out of birch bark strips sewed together with leather thongs. They didn't have rockers as we know them, so the mother would hang the cradle from a branch in a tree and the blowing wind would rock the cradle to and fro. 
the pilgrim boy became so intrigued by this that it apparently inspired him to write a song about it. And that's the same Rockabye Baby we still sing today. Rockabye Baby on the treetop When the wind blows the cradle will rock When the bow breaks the cradle will fall And down will come baby Cradle and all Let's try some riddles from long ago. They're very different from ours of today. Here's one. Black I am and much admired. Men may seek me till they're tired. I weary horse and comfort man. Tell me this riddle if you can. Do you know the answer? It's coal. Here's another. Formed long ago, yet made today. Employed while others sleep. What few would like to give away, nor any wish to keep. Find the answer? It's a bed. Dance to your daddy, my little laddie. Dance to your daddy, my little lamb. You shall have a fishy on a silver dishy. You shall have a fishy when the boat comes in. Dance to your daddy, my little laddie. Dance to your daddy, my little lamb. The story here originated in Holland, where so many of the men earn their living by going out every day in rather small boats to catch fish in a big net, which they bring back at the end of the day to sell at the local fish markets. Naturally, most of them have families, and they bid them a merry goodbye in the morning. Toward dusk, however, the wives and children begin to gather down at the waterfront to wait for the small boats to come into sight. And each wife hopes to see her husband's boat, praying that no accident has befallen him during the day. Those with small babies usually sang to them or played some kind of game to keep the youngsters entertained while waiting for the sight of Daddy's boat. And this song came down through the ages, sung by a mother, dandling her baby on her knee while keeping one eye on the distant horizon. Dance to your daddy, my little laddie. Dance to your daddy, my little lamb. You shall have a fishy on a silver dishy. You shall have a fishy when the boat comes in. Dance to your daddy, my little laddie. Dance to your daddy, my little lamb. Dr. Foster went to Gloucester in a shower of rain. He stepped in a puddle right up to his middle and never went there again. The reigning monarchs of old were the subject of many cartoons and rhymes, in much the same way as our political figures are today. But the poet of long ago didn't dare actually come right out and use the king's name or he might find himself very suddenly behind bars. Dr. Foster, in this case, referred to King Edward I. I suppose the name Foster was used simply because it rhymed so well with Gloucester. However, King Edward arrived on a visit to Gloucester in the middle of a terrible rainstorm. His horse fell and got completely stuck in a huge mud puddle in the middle of the street. It took the townspeople quite a while but with the use of planks, they were finally able to get the king and his horse out of the muck. But they were both a sorry sight, covered from head to toe with gooey mud. The king got so mad over the incident that he flatly refused ever to visit the city again. Dr. Foster went to Gloucester in a shower of rain. He stepped in a puddle right up to his middle and never went there again. (laughs) 
Georgie, Porgie, Puddin and Pie Kissed the girls and made them cry When the boys came out to play Georgie, Porgie ran away Georgie, in this case, refers to George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham. He considered himself quite the ladies' man and slyly flirted with them whether they were married or not. Of course, when the husbands appeared, Georgie would duck out of the scene quickly and would act like he knew nothing about it. Georgie, Porgie, Puddin and Pie Kissed the girls and made them cry When the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. Jane, get up and bake your pies, bake your pies, bake your pies. Jane, get up and bake your pies on Christmas Day in the morning. There was an old woman in a little town in England. She was a widow, and she had a lot of time on her hands. Rather than sit around and do nothing, she tried to think of a way to not only keep busy, but perhaps earn a little money, too. She was an excellent cook, so she hit upon the idea of becoming a lady baker. She turned the living room of her modest little house into a store in which to sell her wares and because of her wonderful ability, began turning out the most marvelous cakes and pies and cookies in the whole county. People came from miles around to buy her wonderful pastries. During the Christmas season, she really outdid herself and worked from dawn until the wee hours of the morning to provide enough goodies for the holiday buyers. One year, the inevitable happened. On Christmas Eve, the poor dear worked so hard over her ovens that the next morning, she overslept. There it was, Christmas morning, and all the people were outside her shop, trying to get in to pick up all the pies and pastries they had ordered for their Christmas dinners. The children, playing in the snow, gathered under her bedroom window and started chanting for her to wake up. She finally did, and very embarrassed, quickly took care of all her customers. But the song became hers, and every year after that, the people would sing it to her, not in mockery, but as a tribute to a nice old lady who had a wonderful way with pastry. Dane, get up and bake your pies, bake your pies, bake your pies. Dane, get up and bake your pies on Christmas Day in the morning. How about, how about another riddle? Higher than a house, higher than a tree, my, oh, my, whatever can it be? I think you already know the answer to that one. It's a star in the sky. Oh dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Johnny's so long at the fair. He promised to bring me a basket of posies, a garland of lilies, a garland of roses. He promised to bring me a bunch of blue ribbons to tie up my bonny brown hair. Singing, oh dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Johnny so long at the fair. Call her Mary, call her Joan. Any name will do. She was just a young girl, left alone by a bow. And she didn't know why. This song is many, many years old. Yet, as these things will happen, old songs suddenly gain new popularity, just as this one did. And you have probably heard many of our singers of today giving it their rendition. But in the old Mother Goose version, our young lady was being courted by a young man 
who obviously promised her many lovely things. He belonged to a traveling circus, which never stays in one place very long. Unfortunately, like the sailor with a girl in every port, he had no intention of keeping his promises and left town with the fair, leaving the poor lass behind, wondering where her Johnny had gone. Oh dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Johnny so long at the fair. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. This is sometimes attributed to Scandinavian myth. It seems that Jack and Jill were very mischievous children, and late one night climbed up a hill to see if they could steal a bucket full of dew that the moon had put there. The moon came out from behind a cloud, and when he saw what they were doing, grew angry at them. So he sent his friend the wind to blow them over, and they tumbled down the hill. While they lay at the bottom, nursing Jack's broken head, the moon captured them and took them up to the sky. It is said that when the moon is full, the children can be seen with a bucket on a pole between them. Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. Little Miss Muffet, she sat on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Down came a spider who sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. Apparently, Miss Muffet was a little girl named Patience, who lived in the 16th century. Her father was Dr. Thomas Muffet, a famous entomologist which is a fancy word for a man who studies bugs and spiders. His daughter, however, did not share his love for the insect world. And when one day, while eating her bowl of porridge, one of her father's eight-legged friends decided to join her, she took one look, screamed, dropped the bowl, and ran off as fast as she could. Do you blame her? Little Miss Muffet, she sat on a tuffet, Eating her curds and whey. Down came a spider who sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. I had a little nut tree, nothing would it bear. But a silver nutmeg and a golden pear. The king of Spain's daughter came to visit me, and all for the sake of my little nut tree. At first hearing this, it doesn't really make much sense. But here again is another of Mother Goose's rhymes that referred to someone in particular. It was the custom in the earlier centuries for parents of royalty to arrange proper marriages for their titled children. Can you imagine? Many princes and princesses were engaged to be married when they were six or seven years of age without even knowing whom they were supposed to marry. It was just something they were brought up to accept. How lucky we are, times have changed. To get back to this particular story, young Prince Philippe, Dauphin of France, was told that the daughter of the King of Spain was coming to visit him. He was too young to know that this was one of those prearranged marriages, so he simply looked forward to a visitor from a faraway country. In the royal garden at Versailles, a solid gold pear and a silver nutmeg 
were tied to a little nut tree to be presented to the visiting princess by the Dauphin. She was delighted with her gifts. They were delighted with each other. Their parents were delighted by the entire arrangement. The people of France were delighted with the union with Spain. And so, when the Infanta, which is what Spanish princesses were called, reached the age of 15, she and the Dauphin were married. And like the end of so many fairy stories, they ended up being the king and queen of France. I had a little nut tree, nothing would it bear, but a silver nutmeg and a golden pear. The king of Spain's daughter came to visit me, and all for the sake of my little nut tree. Here is an old game that people used to play. Everyone seated themselves in a circle on the floor, and one, picking up a stick, pointed it at someone in the circle and said the following rhyme. Buff says buff to all his men, and I say buff to you again. Buff neither laughs nor smiles, but holds his face with very good grace and passes the stick to another place. The player pointed at, then became the next one to pick up the stick and pointed it at someone else. And so on it went. The one rule, however, was that whoever was saying the rhyme could not laugh or even so much as snicker, or else he would have to pay a consequence of some kind. The word buff itself was listed in a 16th century dictionary, and it meant to burst out in laughter. Tommy was a piper's son. He learned to play when he was young. But all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. Over the hills and a great way off, the wind shall blow my top knot off. If you ever study mythology or folklore or legends, you will learn about goddesses and trolls and dryads. The last one concerns this story behind Mother Goose. As the song states, Tom was a piper's son, a bagpiper's son. He learned to play on a reed pipe that he had made himself when he was just a small boy. The townspeople hired him to watch their sheep while they grazed, and to while away the time, he would play his reed pipe. He wasn't very inventive, so he played the only tune he knew over and over again. Now, story has it that the Dryads, who were supposedly lovely young fairy girls who lived in trees, became so entranced by his little song that he piped, would come out of the woods and dance to his tune. The minute he stopped, they would all run away quickly and hide. He told the townspeople about the lovely Dryads, so they tried to come and catch a glimpse of them. But of course, the Dryads were so shy, they would never appear. Poor Tom. No one ever believed his stories about the beautiful creatures who came out of the trees to listen to his piping. I wonder. Tommy was a piper's son. He learned to play when he was young. But all the tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. Over the hills and a great way off. The wind shall blow my top knot off. London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. Build it up with silver and gold, silver and gold, silver and gold. Build it up with silver and gold, my Lady. The history behind this famous nursery song is the story of Old London Bridge, a story which begins in 1176 when it was decided to build a permanent bridge of stone to unite North and South London. After the bridge was finished in 1209, it was sanctified by the addition of a beautiful two-story chapel over the middle pier and rows of nicely designed houses were built all along the bridge, 
making the plain Gothic structure into a thing of such beauty that it was acclaimed one of the wonders of the world. The street floors were rented to merchants who did big business, drawing their customers from the tide of traffic that was coming and going over the bridge. The upper stories of the bridge houses were nicely furnished apartments with bay windows and rooftop balconies, where residents with bay windows could enjoy the fresh air and get a good look at the spectacular view. Once a tournament was held on the bridge, and people were crowded all over the place to watch two knights prove their courage in glorious combat. The London Bridge was often the scene of lavish celebrations, which marked great moments in English history. While living on London Bridge was both grand and glamorous, there were times when it was equally hazardous. Now and then a cargo ship would break away from its moorings and a bowsprit would come crashing through a window. The biggest danger to the bridge and the people on it was fire. In 1666, a fire started in a king's bakery in Pudding Lane. It was later named Charcoal Lane. At first, they didn't think much about it. And then suddenly, a strong east wind spread the fire beyond control, and it swept across the city and onto the bridge. This was the famous Great Fire of London that reduced the world's largest city to a big pile of ashes and left London Bridge a bare, blackened mess. While London was being rebuilt, so were the bridge houses, and the tide of people returned. But as the centuries passed, London Bridge began to feel its age. A lot of water had passed under the old bridge, undermining its foundations. The heat of the fires had dangerously weakened its arches, fallen arches, and heavy timbers braced the tottering houses as violent tremors ran throughout the whole structure. The once magnificent bridge, which had been the pride of London and proclaimed as one of the wonders of the world, was declared a public nuisance and ridiculed in rhyme and song. Finally, on July the 4th, 1823, the death warrant of the old bridge was signed and it was demolished and a new bridge was built in its place, the London Bridge which stands today. But the original bridge still lives on in the famous old nursery song. London Bridge is falling down Falling down, falling down, London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. Polly put the kettle on, Polly put the kettle on, Polly put the kettle on, we'll all have tea. Suki, take it off again. Suki, take it off again. Suki, take it off again. They've all gone away. This rhyme was actually made popular by a composer named Dale in 1794. He had two daughters and three sons. On rainy afternoons, all five children would play games in the nursery. The girls wanted to play house. And naturally, the boys would rather play soldier. In an attempt to get the upper hand, the girls would start to lay out their pretend tea sets on the playroom table. And Suki, whose real name was Susan, would start chanting for Polly to put the tea kettle on to boil. When the boys saw that there was the ghastly possibility that they might get dragged into a girl-type tea party, they ran quickly to another part of the house where they might play soldier undisturbed by their sisters. Then Polly would chant for Suki to take the kettle off. And then the two girls would quietly sit down and play with their dolls. Their father, having heard the chant, put it to music. The song was published in 1797 and became popular as it still is today. Polly put the kettle on, Polly put the kettle on, Polly put the kettle on, we'll all have tea. Suki, take it off again, Suki, take it off again, Suki, take it off again, they've all gone away.
Pussy cat, pussy cat, where have you been? I've been to London to see the new queen. Pussy cat, pussy cat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse under her chair. There are quite a few stories that claim to be the truth behind this rhyme, but it is more often believed that the queen referred to was the Tudor Queen Elizabeth. One of the nurses in the palace had an old tomcat who wasn't very good about staying home, but then most cats aren't. Anyway, this particular cat had a favorite spot to hide, lie in wait for the many mice that overran the palace under the queen's chair in the throne room. The poor nurse was constantly kept busy collecting her pet from his hideaway. And finally, the worst happened. The cat was under the chair when the queen chose that moment to sit down in it. The nurse stood frozen to the spot. Sure enough, there was his tail flicking about in anticipation of a nice mouse meal. When the fuzzy tail inadvertently brushed the queen's ankle, she leapt up in surprise. The poor nurse rushed forward full of apologies and expecting the worst in punishment. But the queen thought it was very funny. So the cat was allowed to live under the throne from then on. And in return, he was expected to keep the throne room free of mice. Pussy cat, pussy cat, where have you been? I've been to London to see the new queen. Pussy cat, pussy cat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse under her chair. Yankee Doodle came to town riding on a pony. He stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy. All the lassies are so smart and sweet as sugar candy. The strange thing about Yankee Doodle is that the tune came first, the words later. Back in the 1700s, when someone played a tune on a flute or a fife, he either deedled or doodled or toodled. This particular melody caught on with the troops during the period when the Americans were fighting the British. They played it as they were marching, or as they went into battle, or whenever they felt like it. So it became known as the Yankee Doodle. Rumor has it that a young drummer boy, while marching along, started humming the tune and put words to it, even though he was no poet. And how many words rhyme with pony? There's phony or uh, baloney, but they certainly wouldn't do. So we just have to accept the fact that he used macaroni, simply for a lack of a better word. But we have taken Yankee Doodle and made it a part of America, and there's not a person around who doesn't know it. Yankee Doodle is a tune that comes in mighty handy. The enemy all runs away at Yankee Doodle Dandy. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle Dandy. All the lassies are so smart and sweet as sugar candy. I hope we've been able to show you what went on behind the scenes with Mother Goose. Some of the real, true things that happened and resulted in a rhyme being written that has stayed with us down through all the years. There's history in history books, but as you know now, there's history in Mother Goose, or rather, history in the tales behind Mother Goose. <laughs> ¶¶